Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Jörg Dvoretsky. I'm a developer advocate at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and today we are hosting the, our regular webinar, uh, one of the webinars from the, our webinar series. And today we have uh, Sebastian Gosgen from Bitnami who will speak about their uh, serverless application pipelines. Uh, I'd like to mention that we will have um, enough time at the end of the presentation, at the end of the webinar to answer all your questions. So feel free to drop your questions to the Q&A section that you may see in the webinar interface right now. So Sebastian, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Ihor. And uh, thank you everybody for joining. Um, I hope that you can hear me well. Uh, and if not, I'm sure that Ihor will, uh, will say something. Uh, I'm broadcasting those slides full screen, so I don't have any feedback on the chat. So I don't know if, if anybody is going to ask us a question during the, the time that I'm speaking and, and demoing, I won't see the question. So, you know, Ihor, please uh, stop me anytime if there is any technical difficulties or if there are any questions. Okay? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, as, uh, as Ihor said, my name is Sebastian Goazgen. I'm the Senior Director of Cloud Technologies at, uh, at Bitnami. I'm currently speaking to you from Geneva in Switzerland. It's pretty cold, there's a lot of snow. And I'd like to talk to you about building serverless application pipelines and what, what does that mean exactly and how does serverless plays a role within CNCF and how does the, the solution that we, we are developing at Bitnami uh, called Kubeless, how does that solution plays a role in the overall serverless landscape and cloud native uh, landscape? Okay, this is you know, very much uh, a talk that I gave at KubeCon, but I've of course modified a few things and added some, uh, some new material. And I, and I, I hope you, you'll like it. Uh, first, you know, I do want to say a few words about Bitnami really quick. You know, this is not meant to be a, you know, marketing, uh, marketing presentation. So I'll dive on, on serverless. But if you don't know Bitnami, we, we package application for all the major cloud providers like AWS, Google, Azure. Uh, we track 150 open source application and we automatically uh, build those applications, package them, and uh, deploy them onto, uh, onto those clouds. Uh, we also build, of course, uh, Docker containers, Helm charts, and so on, with the same pipeline. So we have lots of, lots of expertise in, in packaging those apps and delivering them to any platform. Uh, our products, we, of course, have an application catalog which helps us to build the marketplaces for the cloud. That's probably what you, you know Bitnami, uh, Bitnami for. Uh, we recently, just last week, announced a new product called Stacksmith, which is not an open source product, but I'll, I'll just mention it here. And it's really the productization of our internal build pipeline that we use to populate the, the cloud marketplaces. So we've now productized our internal tooling into this tool called Stacksmith. And of course today, and, and what you know us uh, for in the Kubernetes ecosystem is all our open source efforts. Things like Kube apps, Kubeless, our work with Helm charts. Uh, I, I joined Bitnami through an acquisition of Skipbox and where we had developed Compose with a K, which was one of the first software in the Kubernetes incubator and graduated and you can, you can now find it in the Kubernetes organization. But I also developed Cabin, the mobile app, which we just fixed. So if you've been complaining about the latest bugs, it's, it's been fixed. So the latest version is, is now uh, out there. And of course, you know, right now, Cube Apps, Cube OS, and we, we, you know, to do all of this, we partner with Microsoft, SAP, Heptio, and, and so on. Okay, so that, that's it for the, the Bitnami little, little spiel. And, you know, I don't think we're going to spend an hour here. That's, that's a webinar. I really would like to go to the, to the essence, you know, not waste anybody time and, and just go straight to the, to the meat of it here. Um, what is serverless? And, you know, names, really complicated to, uh, really complicated to, to come up with, uh, with good names. 
And serverless, you know, unfortunately is creating a lot of confusion, even some anger in some circles. What is serverless? And at the bottom, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're calling a function which is, ex which is executing in some type of, you know, binary. There is a Linux, there is a process somewhere that's running and executing that function. So serverless, there are servers behind it, okay? Uh, definitely there are servers behind it. Um, but, you know, what it means is basically that you are only deploying a very small business logic. Uh, you don't concentrate on the infrastructure. You don't concentrate on managing that infrastructure. And you just pay for what you use, which is not new in the cloud uh, sense, you know, it's uh, it's been, cloud has been a utility for a while, but with serverless, you have a very fine grain, um, you know, payment, uh, you know, payment uh, method, if you wish. So you only pay for the function call. Okay, so here is you know that that came from a, from a tweet several years back. There is no serverless; it's just someone else who's managing the execution environment of that function, and you only pay a fraction of a cent for whenever the function runs. So the hope is that one, you don't have to manage any infrastructure, you don't have to provision any infra, you don't have to manage it, you don't know where it's running, you don't know how, you don't care, and you only pay for each function call, okay? So cloud native, of course, this makes, this makes, this makes sense in the, the cloud native uh, sense. You know that CNCF is really broadening its horizon started with Kubernetes that just graduated today, you know, congratulations, Kubernetes. Uh, but, you know, CNCF also recently just accepted Vitesse, the distributed uh, database that powers YouTube. So you got a different type of software uh, joining CNCF. And there is a serverless working group within CNCF. And they define uh, serverless has, you know, it refers to the concept of building running apps that do not require server management. It describes a finer grain deployment model where applications bundled as one or more functions are uploaded to a platform, executed, scaled, built on demand in response to uh, the demand. Okay. And I think that the biggest aspect is really the fine grain uh, payment and the fact that you're not managing any service. So a lot of people will say, if it's a service that's being offered by a cloud provider like AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Function, Azure Function, this is serverless because the users are not aware of any of the infrastructure and they don't manage anything. And then those people will say, if you're deploying something like Kubeless that we're going to talk about, if you're deploying Kubeless on-prem and you're managing it, then you're losing the serverless approach and you're just accessing something which is function as a service, a FAS. So the, the demarcation or the, the, the border between the two would be if you're accessing a cloud provider service, then it's serverless. If you're running it on-prem, then you talk FAS. Bottom line, you know, the, the, the real difference is in, is in usage uh, and it really depends on your user persona. Because if you're using serverless, something serverless like Kubeless on-prem, but that you're not the admin managing the cluster, managing the solution, then, you know, you're really not seeing all this infra. So we could, you know, that's a beer discussion. We could, we could talk more about this. The serverless working group went further than uh, coming up with the definition. There is a pretty uh, intensive white paper that was written by, uh, by the working group. Uh, but they also recently started working on a landscape. So here is a snapshot of that landscape where, you know, you're trying to, you, you, you can see a lot of the solutions that play within the serverless uh, ecosystem and you see at what uh, layer they are. So, you know, security, you see Sneak, for example, and then AWS Lambda in the platform layer, all the way on the right in section that's called Kubernetes native you see some solutions like Kubeless uh, functions, Platform 9, OpenFAS, and so on. I think this is going to evolve. This is still very much a work in progress. Uh, there's going to be you know, improvements made to this, uh, to this diagram. Landscapes are hard. Uh, it's very difficult to put things into a box. 
Uh, for example, you know, in my in my viewpoint, uh, OpenFAS is not really Kubernetes native because it also supports uh, Swarm. So OpenFAS should actually be in the hybrid column, and then Function is not really being developed. So I don't think you know I don't think it should be on there. But you know, that's uh, that's the beginning of a, of a landscape, and definitely keep an eye on it. You'll see you'll see where where things go. Okay. So serverless. Who is the de facto solution right now for serverless? And once again, AWS is in the lead. And AWS has been offering Lambda almost since uh, you know, 2015 or so. So it's been already a couple of years. And what do you do with Lambda? Uh, you have small units of code, small business logic on your computer that you upload into the cloud. And that business logic is called upon when events are being emitted by different event sources. So it could be another AWS service like S3 bucket. You put an object into an S3 bucket. There is a notification that's being sent to a, an underlying uh, message broker. And that message is going to call the function that you uploaded. Or it could be a very simple HTTP endpoint, typically, you're writing a web app, you, are, you have different routes, and when you call slash something, then it calls your function, okay? So the, the code that you're uploading, the lambda, okay, the function, is triggered when events are being emitted. And it's very important. Uh, you know, I feel like a lot of time when we talk serverless, we actually reduce it to webhooks. We are very familiar with webhooks, it's an HTTP endpoint that you can call over HTTP and you get you know, a, a response back. But here with Lambda, it's actually any type, of, uh, any type of function that's being wrapped. You don't really know how, but that function is being triggered by an event. And there are lots of different types of event sources. HTTP is just one way to, in a way, transport an event. Okay, in the, con in the context of AWS, you got Kinesis, SQS, SNS, all the AWS services almost can emit events and trigger Lambda, okay? So from the CLI, what it does it look like? It looks like this. Intentionally, I just pasted the, <laughs> the documentation from AWS. AWS, Lambda, create function, specify a region, specify a function name, you see the zip file? That's where your code for your function is. And it's interesting because Lambda makes you actually create a zip. And then that zip is uploaded to S3. And then they process that zip to create the running environment. We'll, we'll get back to it. There's a concept of runtime, which is the, the language, timeout, memory. The handler information is just the base name of the file that contains your function. And the handler is the actual function uh, name, okay? The fact that you provide a zip here is interesting because that means that the first time you create a function, uh, the, the, the time from making this CLI call to actually being able to call the function is going to be quite big. The zip needs to be uploaded to S3. And then AWS has an internal build, which is going to provision the environment where that function can execute. That means installing dependencies, creating isolation, provisioning potentially some EC2 instances or containers. You don't know, okay? You don't know. That's the point. It's serverless. You don't know what's happening. But that first time is going to be a little bit long. And then subsequently, if you keep calling the function, it will be extremely fast in the 100 millisecond maybe less type latency, okay? So that's the basic CLI for Lambda. And that's how you start deploying functions and building some type of much more complex ap application. So the three concepts that I think are very important here are function endpoints, okay? You have a function, you deploy it, and then you can call that function somehow, somewhere. So you have an endpoint for that function. Then you have a trigger. What is triggering the function? Is it an event that's happening in a S3 bucket? 
Is it uh, a stream of data in Kinesis? Is it a message in SQS? You have lots of different type of triggers, okay? If you're in the Google Cloud, you know, is it a cloud pub sub event? Is it a cloud storage event? You, you name it. There are lots of event sources out there and they're not, you know, they're some, they're, they have different uh, semantics and things like this, but there are lots of uh, event sources. And then the third one is definitely the event. What's an event? And that's where all the work that the serverless working group is doing on the, um, on the cloud events uh, spec is extremely important. Uh, to note that the, the work was initiated by the serverless.com uh, startup, Austin Collins and, and his colleagues really uh, pushed hard on, on creating that spec. But those are the three very important concepts with triggers being you know, very important. There are lots of different solutions out there. AWS Lambda, I mentioned it, top left cloud function as your function. And then you have solutions that you can install on-prem. OpenWhisk, FN, which is a solution from Oracle, Nucleo, that's the little Superman guy there, OpenFaz, and then Kubeless, you know, uh, among, among others. There are new solutions that we're seeing these days, like Riff from Pivotal, uh, VMware has also, uh, you know, their own thing, Dispatch. There are lots of different solutions that are, that are uh, being created. Uh, and they all have, you know, pluses and pluses and minuses, uh, you know, but that's not really the, the, the purpose of the talk here. So I'm, I'm just going to concern it on Kubeless because, of course, that's the project that I work on. But then try to really, you know, be a little bit more generic in the sense of, you know, what is the overall architecture of those systems and then, you know, how to deal with those events and so on. Uh, Kubeless is being uh, used and co-developed with uh, SAP. And we have BlackRock as a big user. If you want to know what, what they do with Kubeless, uh, you should look at the KubeCon talk that I, I gave in, uh, in Austin a couple, couple of months ago. Okay. So Kubernetes native, you, you saw that in the, uh, in the serverless landscape from CNCF that I, that I saw. And the reason why, you know, I, I made a, a little, uh, you know, a, a little poke at, uh, at OpenFAS not being Kubernetes native, uh, is because to me, Kubernetes native means that you're extending the Kubernetes API, okay? Um, and I think that they moved now to actually using a custom resource definition and so on. But they also, that's because they have their own like facilities uh, uh, controller in some sort, but it also runs on, on Docker Swan. So for me, Kubernetes native means that it's really an extension to Kubernetes. Uh, and you can do that using something called custom resource definition, which is a, a core API in Kubernetes. And it allows you to create new uh, REST and API endpoints. And that's what we did in Kubeless. We created a new REST API endpoint to manage, uh, to create function objects. So doing this, we simply now have a new object kind in Kubernetes called a function. So you have pods, you have deployments, you have services, but now you also have a function. Then what do you do with this? You need to write a controller and that controller in our case creates a deployment, creates a config map, can create ingress and so on, which are the, you know, the, the core uh, objects of any Kubernetes application. So we, we're really extending the Kubernetes API and making use of all the Kubernetes API primitives. Okay. Uh, serverless is also uh, very famous for providing you almost transparent auto scaling. Okay, that's the that's the promise. Okay, is that if you start calling your function a lot, bang, 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 automatically the system will scale the number of available function endpoint, and you'll be able to handle more load. Okay, so how can you do auto scaling in Kubernetes? Well, Kubernetes has horizontal pod auto scaler, HPA. But the basic HPA uh, runs on CPU and memory. What we did in Kubeless is that we do auto scaling based on custom metrics. It's very important uh, because you know some functions so you you want to scale based on function requests. 
And those functions may not be consuming a lot of memory or a lot of CPU, but you may, you may be calling them a lot, okay? So you wanna be able to auto scale on custom metrics. And using Prometheus, which is also a project, of course, in CNCF, you see how this entire CNCF cloud native landscape comes together to help build a serverless solution. That's really, really great. So with you, we're using Prometheus monitoring inside our runtime to be able to create that uh, auto-scaling uh, feature. The last component that I'll, I'll mention uh, is uh, service mesh you know, and uh, Istio. So we recently did a, a proof of concept and definitely service mesh uh, are a natural extension to this entire architecture. Okay, because all the, uh, all the function endpoints are mini microservices. And if you use a service mesh, you'll have uh, network encryption between all the functions that talk to each other. You can potentially add authentication authorization for the function endpoint. You have distributed tracing and so on. Okay, so Kubeless as an extension to the Kubernetes API leverages the auto-scaling capability, leveraging the Prometheus monitoring from CNCF, and we'll leverage you know, service mesh. We'll see if Istio you know, joins CNCF at, at one point, but it really you know, becomes all a, a natural integration of all those systems to give you a, an easy way to deploy a business logic, very small business logic that can get triggered by any event sources. And really, you know, the triggering on events is, is very, very important. So the architecture here, you know, I, I tried my best today to, to, to make a, a nice diagram for you. You see that you have the Kubernetes API server that's extended with a, a function CRD endpoint. Once you, you have the CRD that defines the function endpoint, that means that then you can create function objects, store them in the HCD of the Kubernetes cluster. This is all regular Kubernetes uh, operation, right? In green, you have a kubeless controller. That's where you have the magic of, um, of kubeless, which watches the uh, function uh, objects being created. When it sees an object created or deleted, then it acts. And if it's a creation, then it creates a deployment, a service, potentially an ingress, and then stores the actual function business logic in a config map. And at the end of the day, what you end up with, you end up with a running pod, which is a running container, and the function is injected into it. So I'm talking a lot. Uh, hopefully, this is interesting. Um, I'm, not, I'm not seeing the, um, the questions. Are there any questions, Ihor? Maybe if you're still, if you're still there. Might be a we have only one question from Scott who is working at SAP and didn't know that they're working on Kubeless and he's asking how can he can get involved? Yeah, it's uh, Klaus Deissner uh, and then uh, Vasu, um, uh, his last name escapes me, but they're they are working out of Waldorf. Uh, Klaus is in the messaging uh, group and also the SAP folks from uh, Hybris, the e-commerce platform they are integrating kubeless uh, in hybris so that uh, when you have any events in the hybris uh, e-commerce platform it can call functions that have been deployed via kubeless so go, go to the github uh, page github.com slash kubeless slash kubeless or join the kubeless slack in uh, in kubernetes uh, no the kubeless channel in the Kubernetes slack and you'll you'll be able to reach out to them. So here, you know, I wanted to make a, a little segue that uh, there is no war between serverless and, uh, and containers. The, here, you know, the fact is that containers are just a, a really nice way for us to deploy functions, okay? Functions as a service. And there is no friction to have between functions and containers, okay? It's just that Kubernetes is a very nice platform to build on. And then at the end of the day, Kubernetes manages containers. So here, the functions end up running in containers. There is no, there is no need to try to, 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 to have a war here between you know, serverless and, and containers. So the famous custom resource definition, something you should definitely uh, check in, uh, in Kubernetes. 
cube control get custom resource definition and you'll see a uh, functions.cubeless.io uh, CRD which then allows you to say cube control get functions and you'll see the list of functions and be able to deal with functions just like the way you deal with any other Kubernetes objects. Get the YAML, get the JSON, edit the function in place, uh, you name it, okay? Uh, the, uh, the functions are then you know, managed because of this controller. And here, this is a, a little segue or a little uh, hat tip to the Google Cloud Platform uh, meta controller. I think they changed uh, the repo since I, I wrote the slide. But you know, definitely, the CRD controller uh, architecture is, is where a lot of uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, add-ons are going. And if you're trying to build on top of Kubernetes, you should become familiar with uh, CRDs and writing a, a controller, okay? The monitoring, uh, I mentioned Prometheus from CNCF. P Prometheus has clients in lots of languages. So if you're writing a, a, a Docker image that runs, for example, here, some Python code, you can import the Prometheus client and then uh, instrument your function, instrument your Python program with Prometheus code. And what that means is that then, you know, the container will export uh, or will uh, provide a, an HTTP endpoint that will serve metrics. And then Prometheus will scrape those metrics so that you can, you can do uh, uh, auto-scaling. Uh, the one thing to, to keep in mind here and, and to see uh, with, the, with the link that I pasted on top, is that all our runtime are instrumented with Prometheus. That way we, we actually expose uh, functions metrics uh, very closely to, uh, to the function itself and the runtime. And this allows us to, uh, to build beautiful uh, dashboard you know, for all the functions in the, in the system. As I said, you know, with this custom, with the, this instrumentation, then you can get custom metrics. Here, I'll, I'll, I will mention that the, the challenge we've had with uh, auto-scaling on custom metrics is that it was a little bit difficult to configure in Kubernetes 1.7, 1.8, and I'm very happy to see that with Kubernetes 1.9, you can now use Kubernetes auto-scaler using custom metrics on GKE, okay? Uh, it's a little bit, it's still a little bit tricky. You need to export your metrics to stack driver and so on, but you can now do auto scaling on custom metrics. It was a big uh, 1.9 feature and something that they, they managed to set up in, uh, in GKE. So definitely pay, you know, pay, some att pay, pay attention to this and note that it's a little bit tricky to, to set up on your own. So, uh, so be patient as you, as you try. That's the, that's the architecture. Uh, of course, it's very important for any system to build any application to uh, play with uh, the, the current ecosystem. And if you go back again to the CNCF serverless landscape, you'll see one of those solutions in the ecosystem, which is serverless. It's a Node.js platform, which builds an abstraction on top of all the serverless provider, Lambda, Cloud Functions, Azure Functions, uh, OpenWhisk, and Kubeless. Kubeless is one of the solutions that's supported in serverless. And that allows you to basically write a YAML manifest for your function and quickly uh, deploy it uh, using this, uh, this solution. The other thing that I wanted to mention is cloud events. Because in the concepts that I, I, I talked about at the beginning, I tried to put some emphasis to the fact that serverless was more than just a way to deploy webhooks, okay? Functions with an HTTP endpoint so that you can easily deploy uh, simple webhooks. It's way more than this. You need to be able to trigger those functions from any event source. And the example is, you know, messages in Kafka, messages in nats.io, messages, any message broker, but then any cloud services, cloud, cloud pubs, cloud ML, cloud storage, S3, you name it, all those events, Microsoft uh, Event Hub, all those events, right? You have, 
You have all these systems that emit events. Even Kubernetes itself emits events, and it would be great to, you know, of course, uh, uh, trigger functions based on Kubernetes events. So the, the, the big challenge is that there is no specification for an event. That means that all the events that are out there have their own spec, their own format, and there is no, uh, you know, there is no standard. So there is an effort that is now you know, called Cloud Events that aims to describe a spec for what is an event in the cloud native world, okay? And with that, that means they will be able to build libraries, SDK, and so on that adhere, adhere to the uh, cloud event specification. Okay, it's still very early. Okay, let's let's be honest. And you know, every time I talk, I try to tell people the level of maturity of things, so that you know people don't get fooled, kind of, and jump on something when while it's still fresh. Definitely, cloud events is still fresh, and I'm expecting that there'll be there'll be some changes. We're paying close attention to this in Kubeless, and we actually just merged. Um, a change for all our runtime so that functions that are exposed by our runtime uh, actually consume cloud events okay so here you see the basic spec you have an event you have context the context is specific context of the function so the function name timeout runtime memory limit typically the, what what is in the context is what you were providing to the uh, to the, uh, to the CLI by deploying functions. And then in the event payload, you have the actual data plus the event type, timestamp, you know, and then potential extensions and so on, okay? So that's an example of cloud events. I'm expecting this to change slightly over, you know, next month or half, you know, half a year as cloud events becomes, uh, you know, more mature. But it's a, it's a beginning to a, a standardization for what an event uh, looks like. So now, yeah, I should do, I should do a demo, otherwise I'm going to, I'm going to lose you all. Huh? Um, so we'll, we'll see, but I did want to mention, you know, where we're going long-term here with, uh, with Kubeless. And, and the thing, you know, as you build those apps and you think about, you know, what are those apps uh, made of? you'll see that there'll be lots of different event sources, okay? And uh, a system like Kubeless need to be able to handle those event sources. So we are almost done with a, a very important refactor where we will be able to add any type of event source as a new Kubernetes CRD, which will be associated with their own controller. And then those controller will spawn consumers of events in whatever format those are. And those consumers will call the function using the cloud event interface, okay? So this is probably out there. This is the first time that I talk about this, but it's a significant uh, refactor. It's a very exciting one because we, we actually now have it uh, running and we have a Kafka controller that runs inside Kubernetes because there is a trigger CRD for Kafka that's been created. And when you, when you tell the system that a function needs to be triggered by an event in a Kafka uh, topic, then the Kafka controller creates a Kafka consumer on the fly. That Kafka consumer gets the message and then calls the function via HTTP. So that means that every function is now exposed via HTTP with a cloud events uh, compliant interface and then we can add any type of event source like a SQS controller, Kinesis controller, you name it. Okay, So this is a very, very exciting uh, development. But what's a, what's a serverless application? Really the best way, you know, as we talk about those pipelines, what are those apps, is to go to the AWS page. You know, I'm, I'm sorry for the competition, but that's, I'm, a, I'm a graphical guy, so I like, to, I like to see pictures. And if you go to the AWS Lambda page, you'll see a list of case studies with you know very simple pipeline like this. Take a picture, stick it in S3, 
when it's in S3, it triggers a function call to do a thumbnail or a resize or you know create a PDF and then stick it into some other storage. That's one pipeline. Another example, data streams and processing. You have lots of events that are going through Kinesis and each stream you know, uh, is associated with a, a Lambda. So events on a specific stream uh, get processed by a Lambda, which then stores those events in DynamoDB, for example. That's one. You've got mobile case study, IoT case study, uh, optical character recognition, you, know, you, you name it. So how will you build those apps? And that's really the vision you know, of, of why we do this at, at Bitnami, why we, we are interested in serverless applications and why we are uh, getting involved with this. It's because we see apps, we see those pipelines as a combination of, for example, charts. So a local service deployed in your on-prem Kubernetes cluster, okay? It's a local one deployed on-prem. You're managing this Kubernetes. Maybe it's GKE or AKS on Azure. You know, uh, it doesn't really matter. But it's a, it's a service that's deployed inside your own Kubernetes cluster. Plus, some cloud services that you bring in thanks to the service broker. And I haven't talked about the service broker, but it makes a, a lot of sense. It comes from the Cloud Foundry people. We've integrated the service broker inside our solution that we call Cube Apps. So the idea is to get a, an instance of a service from a cloud provider, get some bindings, meaning username, password, some credentials to be able to talk to that uh, service instance. You get that inside Kubernetes, okay? So you have some local services, you have some remote services, and then how do you glue everything together? you glue everything together with your business logic that is deployed as functions and triggered by events emitted by those services, okay? So that's really the architecture of the app. You can see some of the early examples uh, in our function store, github.com, kubeless functions. Though this is going to, uh, to go through a, a major, uh, a major uh, change here. So I hope that that gets you excited. Uh, I'm going to show you a demo, but clearly if you want to try it, uh, try Kubeless, you know, the basic things, look at the great Katakoda, uh, Katakoda playground. There is, there is a Kubeless scenario for, for Katakoda. Okay. So let's get right. ready for, for some demos. I do have a demos here, but if there are questions, let me know. Uh, so if you're ready for questions right now, we have one, uh, uh, you can answer this, continue with them, and we'll ask people to submit other questions. So Josh is asking, as someone who knows very little about FAS, what does Kubeless do that improves upon base Kubernetes? It allows you to deploy uh, functions without compiling or building a Docker image. Okay. Perfect. There is no, there is no Docker build. There is no, there is none of that. Okay. So let me let me show you the demo, and then you know maybe you'll get you'll get a, a better a better sense for uh, you know for uh, for what it is. Um, so you should see you should see my uh, my screen, and I'm on a Kubernetes cluster on GKE. Uh, it's a relatively standard Kubernetes cluster, 187. Let's see if I get the list of nodes back. Here you go. It's three nodes. I just bumped up the memory a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to list all the pods in a namespace called CubeApps. So CubeApps is uh, another open source project from Bitnami, which we call a platform, a package agnostic application launchpad. With Cube Apps, you can launch charts, you can launch functions, you can now create instances uh, of cloud services using the service broker, and we're working on GitOps-like application. So that whatever type of applications you're running in Kubernetes, you can uh, instantiate them, manage them through Cube Apps. 
So I'm going to show you the, the dashboard. What do you see in Cube Apps? You see a lot of Helm related things like a tiller, uh, a tiller server, there's an ingress controller, there's a little uh, database to keep the information about the charts. There is the user interface for Kubeless. There is an API uh, which allows us to, to have some basic REST API to, uh, to tiller. Uh, and then there's a, a dashboard, okay? So that's what I have running in my cluster. I also have a Kubeless namespace. And what you see in the Kubeless namespace, you see a controller, that's the thing that watches the function endpoint, and you see a basic Kafka and Zookeeper uh, setup. If I look at my custom resource uh, definitions, you'll see that I have you know, several, including the functions one, and if I do a kubectl get functions, what you see now is that Kubernetes is aware of functions, but right now I don't have any, okay? So that's the setup of my current Kubernetes cluster. I've bootstrapped the entire environment with Kube apps. So what I'm going to do now is uh, actually show you the Kube apps interface. For this, I just use the Kube apps CLI. I do Kube apps dashboard. And boom, you should now see the Kube apps dashboard. Okay. What you see here is a list of charts. Those are the upstream charts from the uh, uh, Kubernetes slash charts. Okay. So we are surfacing that chart repository. You can add your own chart repository. So you see here, I added one for service catalog. I added one for functions here uh, and so on. Once you find a chart, you click on it and you can, uh, you can deploy. So for example, I could, uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I could do Kafka, Kong, uh, you name it. Usually I go uh, all the way down and, and I launch uh, my little WordPress. So you see that it's rendering the readme. And here the key is that you have a button that says deploy using Helm. So this is deploying the WordPress chart. Um, by talking, you know, to uh, to Tiller, okay, via a little uh, a little proxy. So you see that now it's deploying. I'm just, you know, showing you this as a as a quick demo. And then when you go to applications, you see the applications that you have installed. If I click on Minio, which I installed previously, there is a URL. I click on that URL, opens the window, and I have access to Minio. Okay, so this is just showing you that through Cube Apps you can deploy. Uh, charts, but you also have a function tab. This is not yet nicely integrated, but you know, bear with us. It's uh, it's it's coming. And here you can simply create a functions and say hello, hello dot cncf for example. And you see, I'm going to trigger that function via HTTP. It's going to be a Python function. I'm going to create it, and it creates a very basic app, which is cncf return uh, hello world. Okay. If I had other functions on the left, I could refresh and I would, I would see them, okay? Um, but the bottom line is that underneath, this is actually going to create a deployment, create a service, and here I see the logs. The logs of what? The logs of the pod that ended up created, being created, and when I call on the right, I call run function, it tells me hello world, okay? And I see that in the logs of my app, uh, it, it triggered it with the uh, get slash and it returned a 200, okay. If I call again, it should refresh the log, here you go, okay. So that's the basic, that's the basic thing, thing uh, through Cube Apps, which bootstraps your cluster with everything that you need, not only serverless, but also charts, okay. Here I was able to create a super dead simple hello world uh, you know, out of the, you know, through, through the UI. So you can imagine, you know, what I was saying about those pipelines. Some bits of your apps will be deployed as charts. Some bits will come through the service broker and it's integrated in Cube Apps, but it makes the demo, you know, much longer. And then the glue code will be deployed via Kubeless, okay? If we go back to the CLI now, and we clear the screen. We say, 
kubectl get functions, we now have a function here that's hello. Okay. Uh, under the hood, we also have a config map that's been created, that hello config map. That's where the function is stored. So if I look at the YAML of that uh, config map, you see that the uh, CNCF function here is actually stored in the, uh, in the config map. Okay? So the, when I created the function, you know, at the function uh, API endpoint, the controller picked that up and created a uh, config map. It also created a deployment. So kubectl get deployments, you'll see, uh, you'll see that I have a hello deployment. Okay. I can of course create a function from, uh, from the CLI. And here, you know, if I, I just show you the readme, you'll see that the full CLI says kubeless function deploy. You give it a name, you specify the file from file, you specify the handler, which is the base name of the, uh, the file where the function is. Handler is the function name. You say what it is, Python. We also can do node, you know, you name it. Function triggered on HTTP, it has some dependencies and so on. So here I deploy the function through the CLI. If I look at a get functions, you'll see that I have here, you know, a crypto function created. I look at my pods and I should see a crypto pod. Here you go. And it's already running. Hopefully you see that. And now I can actually call it. I can say kubectl function call crypto. I think it's uh, data. And I can say crypto, crypto, and I say Bitcoin. should return except if I except if it needs a single quote maybe it needs single quotes should I put single quotes yeah there you go single quotes so the current price of Bitcoin is ten thousand nine hundred and ten uh, US dollars okay and if you need you know another uh, another uh, type of crypto there you go, you have repo. So now we you know, not only can deploy through the UI that I, like I showed you, but we also deploy from the CLI, of course. And if I refresh my UI, you'll see that I have my crypto function and I see the actual um, code of my, uh, of my function. I'll do, you know, I'll do one more. I don't wanna, I don't wanna you know, spend too much of your time, but uh, one that is very interesting is that a function is actually a Kubernetes object and it's very important. So, you know, you could actually write a manifest for your function. API version will be kubeless.io v1 beta 1. It's just a new API group. The kind is not pod or deployment, it's function. This is only available if you install kubeless. If you don't install kubeless, that, that function kind doesn't exist. This is only possible because of the CRD. But you have metadata, any metadata, you can put annotation to a function, you can put labels, and you can write a spec, of course. So by default, kubeless is using you know, uh, some, some basic uh, you know, spec. But here you see the, um, the function is part of uh, the spec of the function object. And then you can define a deployment. So, you know, what are actually the, the specificities of the deployment that's being created by, uh, uh, you know, by, uh, by kubeless. So if you write your function object just like this, then you can just create, do a kubectl create. If you are a Kubernetes user, you fall back on your feet. This is just a normal object, okay? And here it says function hello YAML created. But because it's a function kind, when I say, you know, kubeless uh, function ls, oops, if I use the kubeless CLI, kubeless function ls, you see my hello.yaml. 
This is the function that I just created by doing a kubectl create. I hope you get I hope you get the idea, you know, that this is actually quite nice and that you know a function can also be just a pure uh, a pure manifest and then you know you can call it like this kubeless function call uh, hello yamo and it says hello world okay so that one is quite nice uh, do we have time for one more let's do the let's do the slack one uh, uh, and I don't know if I okay to do the slack one let me let me do a, a little I'm just doing a few minutes so if it's fine for you let's do it okay uh let me let me do it because i think it's it's an interesting one uh control c so i'll do one which is about events okay i'm going to create a function that's being triggered by a kafka event so what's my what's my function it's it's just a function a python function that is going to send a message to slack so you see that it's literally uh, 20 lines. You know, the beginning is just like imports. I'm getting my Slack token from a Kubernetes secret. So I pre-created pre -created that. And the actual function is just like four lines. It's a, you know, the Slack client API call, it gets the message and just sends that to Slack, okay? I'm going to create that function from the CLI. So function deploy. You see, I'm calling it Slack event, but for once, this function is not triggered by HTTP. It's actually triggered by an event on, in Kafka, okay? Sadly, this is not using the new ar architecture that I mentioned. It's still using the old architecture, but it will be, the, the UX will be the same. So here you're saying that the function is triggered by a topic, okay? You specify again the function from the file, a handler, a little bit of dependencies as a file, and then it's a Python function. So we check that it created the object, function ls. So yes, we have a function. You see that now the type of the function, look at the type colon at the bottom, it says pub sub. So now it's a new, new type of trigger. It has some dependencies on the Slack client and the Kubernetes Python client. It says that it's ready, so the pods should be ready. So if I look at my pods, I'll see that I have a Slack event pod. They've been created quite quickly, okay? It's probably not as good as Lambda, but you know, they get, they get created quite quickly and we're now going to work on improving performance for uh, you know, cold and, uh, and warm up start by playing with the community scheduler and, uh, and so on. So now, how do I send an event to that function? Kubeless has a little convenience wrapper. So I can do, you know, uh, there's a topic uh, sub command. Uh, so I can say, you know, topic, uh, publish. Let me look at the help. So topic, publish, what do we want to do? We want to publish a message on the Slack topic and we want to send some data saying, uh, you know, uh, what's up? CN, CNCF, EHOR rocks, maybe in double quotes. Okay, so what this did is, there you go. Ah, did you see at the top my, my Slack? Okay, so I have one new message on, one new message on Slack and hop. What's up CNCH, EHOR rocks, okay? So it did, it did work. Let's do one more. Let me do, uh, what's going on? Not that one. Oh, where's my terminal? Ah, there you go. Let me, let me make this one a little bit smaller and let's publish. A new message. Thank you very much. Kubeless rocks. And we should see it on Slack. Here you go. Thank you very much. Kubeless rocks. So that's it for me. 
thank you for your time. I hope that was interesting. And what to keep in mind is that, you know, functions, uh, serverless applications are made of function endpoints, triggers, and then um, event sources. Uh, I mentioned that. And then a pipeline is going to be made of local charts, for example, some remote cloud services coming from the service broker, and then glue code deployed via uh, a FAS, and hopefully you'll use Kubeless. So thank you very much, Ihor. Perfect, thank you, Sebastian. Um, we have four more minutes, and we have one extra question in the chat. So Amelia is asking, are the Kubeless containers get killed after function execution, or they're running continuously? A bit more deep technical question. Yeah, right now there are actually, uh, you have one container that will be running continuously uh, even if the function is not called, okay? That's because the scaling to zero is a, is a hard problem. I'm actually talking with, uh, with Joe Bida. We were exchanging, uh, you know, some, uh, some messages. He was telling me he has some new ideas on the subject, but it's difficult to, you know, kill all the pods and, and then uh, resurrect them when the, the function is actually uh, being called, okay? You may need to play at the ingress uh, layer. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's a little bit more challenging. So for now, we always keep one container running. And I do have to say that I don't think it's really that big of a deal. Uh, some people make it to be a big deal, but then you, you actually look at some of the latest uh, lessons learned from Lambda and you see people faking uh, calls to their functions to make sure that they stay up so that they don't have to suffer the cost of a cold, uh, cold start, okay? So, so even, you know, if, if even AWS users are actually now faking calls so that the functions don't, don't get killed, uh, you know, for Kubeless to, to keep one pod running, you know, I don't think it's a, a huge cost uh, right now, but, you know, definitely we're, we're keeping an eye on the, on the issue. Perfect. Uh, we have two more minutes and we have time for only one question. So uh, we have a question about is Kubeless part of CNCF yet? Uh, so I'd like to provide you, so uh, I'd like to rephrase this question, Sebastian. So can you describe during like one or two minutes the general roadmap of Kubeless? And yeah, actually sure. it's, it's collaboration with CNCF itself. Yeah, so the, the, the general roadmap, I mean, Kubeless very much started as a, a proof of concept uh, back after KubeCon 2016. So December 2016, there were some very interesting talks by Brendan Burns and, and Kelsey. I came back from KubeCon and then did a, a POC of, hey, how could we actually build a FAS function as a service on top of Kubernetes? And then it turns out that people actually got very excited about it. Uh, and we, we decided to, to keep on working on it. And now we have, you know, strong support uh, from SAP. We have a production use case with, uh, with BlackRock and others. So we, we do have quite a bit of traction and we've started some, some big refactor so that, you know, the project can be uh, viable in the, in the long run. So in the roadmap, definitely what I presented, which is the new architecture, uh, I mean, it's, it's new, it's slightly different with the main intent of supporting as many event sources as possible. And serverless to me is all about events. So we need to be able to plug in any event sources uh, that, that could be out there, okay? So this should be merged within the next uh, few weeks and should be part of the, the big release. We're trying to get to a GA and a, and a 1.0 release before KubeCon in uh, Copenhagen, okay? So we are on a two month uh, crunch to, to, to get GA by, um, by Copenhagen. And this will also uh, you know, include a better runtime for things like uh, Go and, uh, and Java because that's been a, a big ask from, uh, from the community. People want to be able to deploy uh, Go functions and, uh, and simple Java functions or maybe even provided as, as jars. 
So the uh, you know those are have been the the two main uh, workforces: the decoupling of what we call it decoupling of events and runtime triggers and runtime, which is now achieved, and then support for Golang and and Java. Uh, those will be the two for uh, the two big things to get to. Um, Two big things to get to GA, and after that, uh, maybe maybe before, maybe at the same time than than 1.0, we also do the uh, the performance improvement, uh, which you know since GKE now supports auto scaling, uh, I've started to talk with Google to be able to see how we can improve the performance of Kubeless uh, for uh, you know cold start and um, you know, warm up of the of the functions when we when we auto scale. So hopefully we'll have some very good data to showcase at uh, at KubeCon. Perfect, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are ran out of t of time. So thank you, Sebastian, for this amazing webinar and showing us the, all the benefits of having the serverless applications running together with Kubernetes. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody that if you have missed a part of this webinar, you'd like to watch it again. Would like to share it with your colleagues and friends. All the webinars are recorded and are available, available at the cncf.io website. T together with the upcoming webinars that are announced there as well. So thanks everyone for joining us today and hope to see you next week. Okay, thank you very much.